Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am Harris Kondoest, Research Director of the National Observatory of Athens, Director of the Earth Observation Center of Excellence Beyond of the National Observatory of Athens, and Coordinator of the GeoCradle Initiative, uh, which is for the coordination of Earth Observation, Geo and Copernicus in the regions of the uh, European Union. I'm honored by your participation in the session on Earth Observation for Climate Change and Mosquito-Borne Diseases which focuses on the global challenge to confront, but even more forecast the burden of mosquito-borne diseases and support the process for drawing reliable health policies in the domain by using scientific evidences designed, derived by the use of the Big Earth Observation data. Global trends such as the changing climate and ecological conditions, uh, global travel and trade, rapid and unplanned urbanization, as well as the human behavior are driving the re-emergence of the mosquito-borne diseases posing challenges to the public health authorities in the European region, as well as at the non-European territories. The map that, I see, that you see on this slide, published by the ECDC in 2020, is a vibrant example illustrating the spread of West Nile virus cases in Europe and neighboring areas for the period 2011-2020. It clearly highlights the outbreaks spread uh, across Europe, and one can easily understand that there is a constantly increasing need to innovate on the control of mosquito-borne diseases and assess the climate change impact into the specific health sector. Allow me to highlight that in this direction, significant efforts have been undertaken during the last three years in the framework of the Eurogeo Action Group for Epidemics. This group gave birth to a system which is called EWA, that is a system which is scalable, sustainable, early warning system for assessing mosquito-borne endomological and epidemiological risks at European Union level, which consists today a game changer in the domain of epidemics. The EWA system supports sustainability by addressing the relevant priorities of the geo-societal benefit areas, the Agenda 2030, and the sustainable development goals such as good health and well-being, sustainable development goal three, climate action, sustainable development goal 13, and sustainable cities and communities goal 11. EWA is a geo system and uh, it builds up on the triptych, the geo triptych, advocate, engage, and deliver. The consortium that we have built in the system, the EWA consortium, seeks to exploit synergies at several levels. It relies on exhaustive inventorying of needs, priorities, and gaps in the domain of health for the engaged regions and users. It is based on a coordinated co-design approach and integration uh, of uh, stakeholders into the development of the system. It leverages so, the engagement of a wide community of scientists, stakeholders, institutional users, health organizations, and those organizations that own data, big data, and expertise. And the consortium delivers in the end, a system which is capable to analyze multi-source and multi-temporal big data, representing large geographic areas and providing digital service and information for enhanced control of mosquito-borne diseases at various spatiotemporal scales. So we start from the local scale, we degrade at the level of the region, we come up to the level of the country, and our vision is to cover the entire continent, the European Union continent. On this slide, you see the, the, the consortium, the EWA team, actually, which we call consortium. Actually, it is an open teaming, teaming uh, process. It is an open consortium which uh, uh, accepts uh, on board uh, newcomers and uh, new scientists, new countries, that they can bring expertise and uh, data into the development of the EWA system. For the time being, it consists of 15 partners from five European unions. Uh, it is an open consortium, as I said, and it is uh, uh, for the today engaging uh, uh, Greece, uh, France, Italy, Serbia, uh, Germany, uh, and uh, 37 institutional key stakeholders uh, acting globally in the domain, uh, which are uh, from the public health uh, um, uh, institution uh, community, as well as a number of involved co-designers and end users from European and non-European territories. The core of the consortium is three strategic partners acting from Greece, is the Center of Excellence Beyond uh, for the of the National Observatory of Athens, uh, 
the eco development uh, company specialized in mosquito control uh, and uh, data analytics and the laboratory of atmospheric physics from the university of patras however in uh, our team uh, we have uh, esteemed and key professionals from the other countries i mentioned before these are uh, 12 more institutions engaged, such as um, the University of Thessaly and Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, the Instituto Zooprophylatico Experimentale della Venezia, the Edmund Hmart Foundation, the University of Trento, the University of Novisad, the German Mosquito Control Association, the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical, Tropical Medicine, and the Aid Mediterrane Institution uh, from France. In a nutshell, and just to close this brief introduction, our system, it integrates a plethora of uh, satellite Earth observation data. It uh, combines at the same time Earth observation data with the domological, epidemiological and crowdsource data together with socioeconomic and demographic data so as to be able to assess the vulnerable uh, populations and, uh, and uh, ages. At the same time that uh, we are predicting uh, populations of mosquitoes and uh, risks for uh, human cases. Uh, for the time being, it is uh, a fully operational uh, system uh, implemented in nine regions over Europe, in Greece, Italy, France, Serbia and Germany. And uh, so far, we have supported uh, targeted acts, uh, actions for uh, organizations dealing with mosquito control and mosquito surveillance. So um, uh, the consortium is um, expanding uh, continuously. As I said, it is a totally voluntary action. It is in the framework of the Eurogeo Action Group that it is uh, being developed. And uh, as uh, so, uh, it is open to interested organizations and scientists to uh, be on board and uh, bring their expertise and data uh, if they wish so as to expand this, um, uh, this action uh in europe but also outside european territories so um this is uh, my brief introduction and um and uh, actually by this i would like to pass directly to the main part of this uh, session which is comprising of key presentations from scientific uh, from scientists uh, uh, in the field uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Nicholas uh, Stylianakis, Professor of Epidemiology and Biomathematics, working in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Uh, Nicholas' uh, research uh, interests are in the mathematical theory of infection disease, infectious diseases, theoretical immunology, and uh, viral dynamics and environmental health. Dr. Stylianakis will give a talk on the dynamics of vector-borne diseases in a changing climate. So I will give uh, the floor uh, to uh, our colleague Nikos. I stop sharing. Nikos, the floor is yours. And you could uh, share your uh, presentation yes. uh, to our audience. Thank you very much. OK. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay, you should be able to see the presentation, right? Not uh, no? yet, not yet. Uh-huh, wait a second. Excuse me. Now? It's loading. Yes, we can see it. Yes, thank okay. you. So, okay. So, I guess you can see that, right? Yes, Nikos. Okay, yes, thank you. We so, can let, see, me, we can let me. Yes, uh, I will. Thank you for the kind invitation. I will. I will say a few words about uh, the uh, this link between uh, vector borne diseases and the potential link and uh, a changing climate. And I will focus a little bit on. Uh, on the, the dynamical point of view. So how um, a changing climate uh, may uh, affect the transmission dynamics of vector-borne diseases. Um, and the typical example is, um, you know, this is the Sunday review of the year 2000 entitled Out of Africa, referring to the introduction of uh, West Nile virus in, actually in the United States back in 1999. It was observed first time in, in, in that year in New York and ever since 
of surveillance over more than 20 years has shown that we, we, we've had uh, more than 50,000 human cases. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. As you know, in West Nile virus, as in many of these diseases, we don't observe all of them. Uh, this is maybe 10%, uh, if we're lucky in that case, uh, of the total infection numbers. Uh, with a substantial number of newly invasive infections or clinical uh, uh, infection with uh, severe clinical symptoms and uh, more than uh, 2,400 deaths so far in the United States. Now, you may find the numbers for a period of 20 years um, not so big, but one has to think that we talk about the introduction of a pathogen in the continent, and uh, this pathogen is now prevalent in the Americas. And we talk about um, uh, prevalence from Thompson, Manitoba, which is in 55.7 no degrees north in Canada down to Argentina. So you can find that everywhere. Uh, so within this period, the, the, um, the pathogen has expanded throughout the continent. So this comes uh, within the content of, um, uh, of the impact of uh, climate change may have on human health. This is a figure produced by the CDC, the US CDC, uh, that gives an overview about these impacts. And one of them, as you can see, is basically the change for in vector ecology. So we expect to have changes in vector ecology, which will affect or is affecting already some of the uh, um, vector-borne infectious diseases which are prevalent globally, malaria, dengue, uh, Lyme disease, chikungunya, and West Nile virus are some examples of them. So this is the big picture, actually, and I will refer a little bit on the on the changes, which is of the topic of, of today on, on, on vector on vector borne diseases. So this um, uh, this is another figure going back of almost ten years ago, showing this um, observed increase of um, a certain number of uh, vector borne diseases like Lyme disease, dengue, um, chikungunya, uh, tick-borne encephalitis uh, globally. So this is, um, this is something that uh, has been observed over the last uh, years, uh, 20 years at least. Uh, Zika is another example. This is actually the uh, spread of Zika over the last, well, seven, 80 years. It was identified back in 1947 in Uganda. And um, of course, there have been outbreaks from again and again over, the last, over, the, over, over, the, over time. And the most known and uh, the, the outbreak that went through the media, of course, was the Zika virus outbreak in, uh, in, uh, um, in Brazil in 2015, which was a major issue. And um, um, there was an enormous worry about um, its uh, potential to spread uh, further globally. Um, so we have uh, to deal with here with an issue which we have to take serious. Uh, all of you are, I think we agree upon that. Um, very fast, as I indicated, we, this observation is not new, it has been around 20, 30 years. In the Western Hemisphere, we talk about dengue, chikungunya, zika. In Europe, if I have to specify, I remind you that dengue was last, the last major outbreak we had in dengue was back in 1927, 28 in Greece. Ever since, not much happened in that context, but today it is endemic in Madeira. In 2012, we had a huge outbreak in Madeira, actually, and we have it every year. Uh, uh, and we held also autochthonous cases in southern France in 2010 and 2013 to 2015. Um, the, in terms of West Nile virus, which I mentioned in the beginning, in southern Europe, we had only in 2018, we had about two more than 2,000 observed cases. Again, these are only the observed cases. We talk about at least a much higher number of, 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 of real cases that, took, that uh, happened, infections. Um, and if one compares that with the period 2010 to 2017, uh, which was about 1,800 cases, so when you can see the potential of these, of these, um, these um, uh, disease may have actually, um, uh, and it is totally unpredictable. Um, the uh, similar is also for the chikungunya virus that uh, we had two outbreaks locally in, in, in uh, Italy, 2007, 2017. Now, if one goes to, um, one way to assess this besides the field studies that uh, of course they've been performed uh, um, uh, globally, um, we have also some quantitative tools, uh, and the, this is actually the, the, the very basic Ross-McDonald mathematical model that describes the transmission dynamics of a vector-borne 
infection. Our note is the very well known, meanwhile, uh, to, to everybody. Um, the basic production number, which can be determined also in the terms uh, in the context of a vector borne disease. As you can see, this number is derived actually from the mathematical model, this condition. And the parameters involved in this condition um, are all associated actually with um, the mosquito. And um, is if these are mosquito features, so the features of the, of the vector, and given that the vector has um, is slowly is, is very is very closely associated with um, with climate conditions. It is a, it is a no brainer that um, you know it, it, there will be some impact from climate variability and change on the transmission dynamics of these infectious diseases. And uh, we have already observations this con observations in this context. Now, in terms of health risk assessment, the tools we have for that are you know, surveillance systems. Uh, they've been all over the world. They're not perfect. Uh, they need to be improved. Uh, we can talk about that, how they can be improved. But we have, uh, we have uh, uh, satellite remote sensing now involved, GIS, statistical techniques, risk mapping, and of course, modeling approaches, trying to answer questions like uh, estimating uh, the distribution of victor species under different scenarios. Uh, the refinement of distribution models of vector species, identification of areas that are at higher risk to be invaded, um, identification of vectors that pose serious threats, of course. A, an interesting aspect is also to model how the, the uh, vectors, pathogens, and humans dynamically interact. So we want to quantify actually the risk. And one way to do that besides the valuable information one gains from the field studies is also to perform uh, this type of uh, mathematical modeling. Now, the fundamental, at least three major fundamental questions we were trying to address here in this context are, in my view at least, is uh, how climate variability and change affects the risk of the vector-borne diseases. Then the second major question is how spatial temporal associations between the meteorological conditions and the vector distribution evolve over time. And of course, a third question, which should not neglect, is whether other factors, environmental and non-environmental, play a role there, and what is their relative importance compared to the climatic factors. So we should factors. So we should not necessarily focus only on climate. There may be other factors that they also play some such a role, and should not um, be so focused only on climate. Uh, although climate plays a fundamental role, this is a little example uh, from uh, a study I performed with a colleague of mine in um, uh, trying to answer the question about how, whether we can predict the, the West Nile virus outbreak occurrence and whether we can design effective control strategies. And then we had, uh, we had a, a relatively big mathematical model trying to describe the, the transmission of West Nile virus. And we had in this model about 20, 25 parameters, but then um, with an analysis we do, we could uh, figure out that four of these parameters uh, would basically uh, mainly affect the basic production number and the number of infections in humans, which was in that case the birth and death rate of the mosquitoes and the mosquito biting rate, as well as the transmission probability from birds to mosquitoes. So we could reduce this huge variability uh, of the effects of 20, 25 parameters down to four parameters, which would allow us, of course, to uh, do a much better analysis to see how uh, 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 we could focus also in that case uh, in the type of control strategy we would actually uh, try to implement in that context, knowing that it is mainly these four parameters that play a fundamental role. And we could see that um, uh, in a scenario we run there with uh, showing a typical case of temperature and uh, change uh, a scenario of, of, uh, uh, by three degrees more or three degrees less, uh, how increased temperatures result to maximum, um, to earlier maximum actually over time, and of course the increase of number of um, of infections. So we have uh, changes in the number and also a shift in the in the time in the time. And this is these are in, insights one can get from these type of models that can be very useful in the implementation of control strategies. Finally, let me conclude again with uh, the little observation that although climate variability and climate change um, plays a role, there are other factors that we should actually not ignore and try to figure out what is their importance there, like deforestation, 
this is the keyword is the biodiversity reduction issue there. Agriculture, so how land and water management practices uh, influence the, the changes in the vector, in the, in the vector dynamics. Um, urbanization, so population density, travel trade, uh, demographics, um, all these things um, run in parallel, and we should think about, you know, how they also may affect uh, the, 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 the transmission dynamics of these diseases. Then we should also be aware of the fact that uh, there may be expansion, but also contraction of geographic, geographical areas and density of vectors. So this, um, it is not only, you know, you can't have expansion because of the changes in, in all these factors. We, affected by all these factors, but there might be also contraction because of the improvement in healthcare systems, et cetera. So it is not, it is not one directional. And of course the socioeconomic factors, for instance, we know that poverty uh, um, and access to healthcare, you know, is closely associated with um, a higher uh, prevalence of uh, infectious diseases. And uh, of course the other side is the access to, 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 to healthcare. So this is all I wanted to say, just to set the scene that climate change variability and potentially change seems to play, to play a fundamental role in the impact of transmission dynamics of these diseases, but we should not also ignore other factors that may also play a role. And um, it is up to, to science now to provide field epidemiological data and assessments and in combination with quantitative assessments through, through more complicated modeling approaches. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, dear Nikos. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation. Kindly stop sharing. Thank you very much, because I have to give directly the floor to Dr. Professor Dr. Jonas Mitsanasit, uh, German virologist and professor of arbovirology at the University of Hamburg. Jonas is uh, the deputy director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Arbovirus and Hemorrhagic Fever Reference and Research at the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine. Uh, Jonas is, talk is talking about the discovery, ecology, and uh, evolution of novel and emerging, re emerging arboviruses. Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Harris, for the nice introduction and uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very honored to speak here in front of all those uh, interested colleagues. Uh, so first, I want to start with a slide uh, from a recent publication that I found really interesting uh, that showed that the total reported cost of invasion uh, reached a minimum, uh, a minimum of, of 1.288 trillion US dollars so this includes a lot of different species, but however, the majority of the commodative posts is related to invasive mosquito species, uh, such as the Aedes uh, albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, these findings um, call for the implementation of consistent management uh, and action, uh, international policy agreements that aim to reduce burden of invasive mosquito species and associated pathogens such as arboviruses and related epidemics. Um, what we do um, in terms of our AVA collaboration is that uh, the epidemiology of arboviruses is influenced by various factors, including climate change, increasing areas of deforestation, the increasing speed and transportation of hosts and vectors, um, disordered urbanization, among others, which lead to a more frequent contact between humans or domestic animals to wildlife and vectors. And we're going to analyze this. Thus, we are interested to identify arbovirus vectors and, uh, and the reservoir hosts and characterize the epidemic uh, potential. Therefore, we want to first develop the circulation of arboviruses and mosquitoes we do not exclude other arthropods, however, we focus on mosquitoes, wildlife, and domestic hosts using the metagenomic approach. And one we are really uh, intensively using is the Illumina technology beside others. Second, we characterize the complete genome of the newly detected arboviruses. So we perform evolutionary uh, genetic analysis, including phylogenies, recombination, uh, host switching of the detected arboviruses 
the report, uh, we identify the arbovirus effect of blood meal hosts, uh, which is very important in terms of reconstruction of the cycles, and we develop phenology models for the vector identified. And last but not least, fifth, and therefore we rely really on vector competence studies, we correct the temporal variability in arbovirus transmission intensity mind potential environmental drivers of that variability and here uh, we have uh, we really rely on the data that we see from Eva for example to do this however I would like to focus on another point uh, um, during my presentation and this is citizen science because how we can produce such profound important data we do not have enough resources to do this so we, we really rely on citizen science program and one of such projects is the so-called dead bird surveillance that, that we are running for, for decades now in Germany and that provides us with very, very important data besides other citizen science projects that focus, for example, on your vector. So this is usually how it looked like. So we got a lot of uh, every day you see here and the birds that were sent to us from all people over Germany, but also from Austria and sometimes from Switzerland. And you can see here that in terms of the surveillance method, the dead bird surveillance is a very, very sensitive method and provide a very early warning sign for arbovirus emergence, such as when the virus which emerged in 2000 in Germany. And uh, this is how all the data comes together. So we have the abiotic factor, the biotic factors, and you can see here that there were ideal conditions in the Eastern part of Germany and exactly here, the West Nile virus emerged in 2018, and we detected the first human cases that were also diagnosed in our laboratory in the same area. So we have a very nice early warning uh, for the presence of a, a human pathogenic viruses, and we can also follow the spread of those viruses within Europe from Africa. This is an example for Zutu virus, but also with Germany. Also, have the possibility based on the sequence data to clearly say when the pathogen was introduced from where on the uh, molecular clock. So, in conclusion, and this will be my uh, last slide. Um, first, I think we are pushing nature to its limits and stressing the environment. I think this is clear. Those we are creating the conditions in which arbovirus epidemics will increase in the future. This risk. We have invested millions of euros or US dollars in the defense against an army that never might uh, come across a border. In contrast, we invested almost nothing in arbovirus epidemic preparedness in Europe. Those Eva, I think, is a chance to really change the situation in Europe. And um, we as individuals and as communities recognize that the pure individualism gets us nowhere. We have to act collectively in the face of an arbovirus epidemic. And I think this is exactly what we do in Ava. And I hope that we will have more partners in the future um, yeah, to increase the output and to make it um, more sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank you very much, uh, Jonas. Very interesting presentation. And uh, I do believe that working together like we did the, the last two and a half years in the Eurogeo Action Group, it will be very promising action in the end. And uh, again, allow me to repeat uh, myself saying that it is an on-pen action. And uh, we would like to have on board any other interested scientific organization or scientists or data providers so as to expand this uh, this uh, this action i mean to the to the to the bigger area thank you very much indeed and now i'll give the floor to dr francis schaffner medical and uh, veterinary entomologist from the university of zurich and president of the european mosquito control association uh, francis uh, the floor is yours uh, is uh, francis going to speak about the importance of earth observation data in mosquito-borne disease risk assessment and vector control implementation. Uh, we're happy to hear you, Francis. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you to my um, <coughs> good afternoon to everybody. And thank you to my colleagues for these nice talks that were preceding. So uh, Nicolaus has well introduced the fact that not only climate data has to be used for, for our work, for assessing the risk for and managing the risk for vector-borne diseases. And I will 
focus a little bit more on the entomological data. So for assessing the, the risk for vector for mosquito borne diseases, uh, we need uh, several parameters need to be there to have, a, to have a real risk. So first we need to have a vector population that is capable and efficient to transmit a pathogen. Um, that's the first uh, condition. Then the second one is to have the pathogen at an infective state. So it has to be there, but it has to be able to infect the mosquito and then to start the transmission. And of course, you need to have suitable hosts, so both for giving for the, as donor or reservoir for providing that pathogen in an area, but also you need to have susceptible hosts that, that then can be contaminated or infected and can develop the disease maybe. Um, and this all works only even if you have only these, if you have these three parameters, it's not enough. You need to have favorable factors on the environment, from the external environment. So these are weather conditions, but also other factors to put the vector and the host together to have the contact. So these factors that will allow the outbreak to work and the transmission to occur. <clears throat> So for the, for the vectors themselves, we look at the vectorial capacity. That's the key factor that we are looking there. Uh, and this is determined by a number of parameters. The first is the vector competence that, uh, that has been uh, talking about it uh, just before. Uh, it's a co-adaptation between the vector or pathogen. So that's something that we can assess in the lab. The key uh, element is here, the extrinsic cycle. So that's the duration of the cycle in the vector where the pathogen will multiply, reproduce, and reach the salivary gland. And only when it is in the salivary gland, the transmission will be possible. So not all mosquito can transmit every vector. So that's very specific. It's a specific uh, couple of uh, vector and pathogen, vector population species, but also population within a species and the pathogen. And then you need to have a density of vector population. It's not enough to have just uh, one population. If it's not dense, um, a, vector, a population that has a low capacity, if the density is high, it will work well, probably. But if it has a high density but the, or a low density and a low uh, capability or even a high capacity, capacity with a low density, uh, it will not, not work well in in the in the field context. Of course, you need to have also vectors that have a certain age and a certain longevity because when they are young, they are not infected. They cannot transmit anything. They need to first to have a blood meal that is infectious for the for the vector. And then later on the second blood meal or even or the third one only sometimes will be infectious for other hosts. And of course the host preferences of these vectors, even if they are competent, if the vector is biting several hosts, it has not the same impact as if it's biting only human, for example. If it's a human disease or pathogen like chikungunya that affects many only human, or some simians, but not in the European context, you need that to have a vector population that bites many human to be efficient. And the biting rate is important. So the number of bites that the people get from that uh, competent population, but also this will only work with um, climatic and environmental conditions that will allow that to work. So these parameters that we can check for using, for modeling or for assessing the risk with earth observation data, temperature, rainfall, temperature, environment, host distribution, so not only the climate, but also where the host, the giving, the donor host and the receptive host, receptible, are located, how dense they are in the environment. And the vector and the host distribution and environment, they need to meet together at the right place at the right moment. So this, all these parameters can be used for assessing uh, a risk so what we currently do um, in, in uh, concretely is to map the presence, the activity and the abundance of the vectors as a first step, I mean. So this is mainly based on field data. So data that you can collect on the field with traps or samplings or whatever. And then with modeling uh, based on earth observation data, Moody's data, bioclean variable or other ones, you can extrapolate this data and model and, uh, prov and produce some risk maps. So the first step is just uh, showing the distribution of a mosquito species. So that's an example for the tiger mosquito uh, at a pan-European or continental scale. 
So these are really uh, field data that are reported by experts. So where it is read, the species is established. So the populations are there. Uh, so that's the first step. Then you can model the probability of presence. So based on presence absence data and based on other parameters uh, like environment, biological parameters, or just extrapolation from the statistical uh, presence absence data sets, you can assess the probability of presence. Uh, at a continental scale, but of course also at the country scale, but that is an example uh, at large scale. Then you can also assess the start of the activity of the of that mosquito. This is uh, still for Aedes albopictus. So based on a number, a high number of field data collected through uh, Vibonet and Vectornet network, you can uh, assess the start of the activity over the over the continent and the number of weeks of, of activity. So this reduces, of course, the, the period of risk. So then you can go deeper into your uh, risk assessment uh, mapping. And then some other steps. The next step would be to assess the abundance because uh, I told you if the, the mosquito need to be abundant to really represent a high risk. Uh, so this has been done for, these are two examples for the tiger mosquito again, but also for Aedes caspus, which is a putative vector of uh, other viruses like Taina or Rift Valley fever uh, virus, uh, which is located in more um, restricted environment uh, like uh, brackish water. So that's why it is mainly coastal on the map or sometimes inland in, um, in the poor uh, plain because they have a lot of rice fields and this mos mosquito is developing there. So there you can also uh, produce uh, risk maps based on presence, but also abundance uh, data. But this is very complicated. I mean, collecting abundance data on the field, standardizing these data and using them these at a large scale is uh, really complicated. But more about transmission risk, that means that you have then to assess other data related to the pathogen uh, themselves. So uh, Nicolaus has introduced the, the R, R0 uh, we can use the ve vectorial capacity or the R0, but there we need again presence absence. This, this example I, I used is a presence absence data of a disease and the model with also with earth observation data. That's an example made by Rogers and colleagues on uh, dengue. Um, the references are missing on my screen, so it's, it's more down, so I don't know if you see them. And this is, uh, they used um, some other data set, uh, NLDI model with env environmental distance between the places where the disease occurring, where it could, it is possible to occur according to earth observation data. And of course, they, you can make it much more complicated. And now the, at the beginning, the models were simplified. We used mainly the, the temperature, but now we have more capacities, more powerful, uh, computers so we can add more data and we also better understand this complex um, interaction of the different parameters. And last for managing the risk, so for doing vector control, because that's one of the way for managing a vector borne disease risk is to control the vector. So reducing the number and the longevity of the vectors. The second option would be to use personal protection. That's simple, but then you re just reduce the contact between the host of, of the vector. But you need to give recommendation to the people uh, permanently. They have to protect themselves at the right place, at the right moment with the right method. It's not that easy. But you can also, in some cases, you, pro you can protect the host at risk to apply preventive therapies or a vaccine, like yellow fever, if there is a very, very good vaccine, so you can protect the people or stop a transmission with vaccination at a large scale. But we, talking about, the, so here also we have to, to define where, when um, the, the host or, or the vectors are exposed and has to be uh, controlled. And this is done, for example, this is one example for using a vector control or using earth observation data to improve the vector control. This is for North, North, uh, Northern Greece in Santa Macedonia where they did adjust the number of mosquito sampling and the number of chicken sentinel to the network to, to assess, to have a better West Nile risk prediction. So that's an example. There are other examples, but um, this, this is the way where we can use uh, earth observation data. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Francis. Um, uh, and now I think we, we, we should pass to the fourth presentation of the day provided by 
Dr. Professor Tatiana Loboda, uh, professor in the field of geospatial data science and chair of the Department of Geographical Science of the University of Maryland. Uh, Tatiana is uh, giving a talk on uh, the Myanmar Malaria Early Warning System, uh, MNUS, if I spell it well. Earth Observation Supported Monitoring and Forecasting of Malaria Risk in Myanmar. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take us in a little bit more of an exotic location, which is Myanmar. And I like to work in areas where we don't have a lot of data, a lot of field data, and where the possibilities for collecting field data are quite challenging. So, Myanmar is a very interesting place. As you all know, malaria occurrence has been dropping globally, and the gains that we have seen in the Greater Mekong area have been very, very impressive over the last decade. Unfortunately, the, um, this happens to be the same area that remains a very key malaria battleground, because we have documented emergence of resistance to the parathyroids in the mosquito population, as well as the genetic mutation in the parasite population that make them less susceptible to the artemisinin resistant drug therapies. So essentially, eliminating malaria in the greater Mekong region remains really critical because if these genetic mutations escape in areas where we see more malaria prevalence, we're going to lose the uh, gains that we have achieved. Myanmar, similar to the all other countries of the greater Mekong area, has been a phenomenal success story that is pre-coup situation. The challenges become is when your distribution of disease is now less spread and becomes more and more narrow, finding those remnant pools of parasite populations and eliminating them becomes more and more challenging in terms of operations. Another challenge, as somebody has previously mentioned, and I think several of our speakers have previously mentioned, is many of the cases that we're seeing are asymptomatic. That means we don't even know exactly where the parasitemia is present because here in uh, one place where we tested extensively in Rakhine State, Myanmar, the symptomatic versus asymptomatic is about one case in a hundred, roughly, which is very, very low. But to eliminate malaria, you really need to eliminate all parasites. And then on top of it, Myanmar is quite a unique place where a lot of areas are not under control of the central government or were not under control. And they are extreme outliers in very vulnerable conflict impacted areas. And that was pre-coup in February 1st, 2020. We, sorry, 2021, we had coup d'etat in the country where now there is no malaria surveillance and we expect that we're going to lose a lot of ground there. So the method we're using for our early warning system is really based on the theoretical framework of the risk modeling that is accepted by the IPCC. So we're looking at risk as the overlap of the hazard exposure and vulnerability, which for malaria are defined in a very specific case. So the Hazard really depends where malaria, uh, determines where malaria comes from. And we have the parasites and the vectors. And that's the area where most of our earth observing systems have been traditionally employed. While looking at vegetation stress, at land surface temperatures, the challenge of course is this is a heavily monsoon impacted region which means the earth observing systems have anywhere between three to five months of no data whatsoever during the monsoon season. So being able to determine uh, how to gap fill those observations becomes really critical importance. 
And we not only gap fill those observations, we also downscale the observations to the 30 meter resolution, which becomes operationally relevant, determining where you're going to send your um, public health professionals to help with potential disease outbreak. But in addition to the hazards, which generally receive most of the attention, Exposure and vulnerability are really two key parameters where Earth observations are also very, very useful. How do people get malaria very frequently in remote rural areas is determined by how the people live, what are the environmental settings in which people live, and as well as what do they do, what is the occupational exposure that they encounter in their um, everyday life. Myanmar, unlike Europe, has a fairly poor understanding of the geospatial and the geospatial data set availability in general. So something that we have to develop is the human presence detection, which again is mapped fairly well in those areas where the government controls the area, but in remote, remote rural settings, the distribution and the availability of the distribution maps is very poor. We use Landsat rather than high resolution observations to map that, which makes it very possible to repeat on an annual basis. And once we have our improved population presence areas, we can build improved population distribution maps, which is now again, estimating population presence at 30 meter resolution compared to the village track, which is available based on the census measurements. Another thing that we use Earth observing data for is to build the base map, which is land cover land use maps, which help us to understand both the environmental niche for mosquito distribution, as well as the general occupation for people and how those two interact. We're able to map not only presence of the population, but where managed forests are, which includes both plantations and logging concessions, where the cropped areas are and how the people are interacting in those with the mosquito populations. And finally, malaria risk is also impacted by vulnerability. Why are some more people, why are some people more likely to get sick? And why is it harder to get treatment in some areas? And a lot of that is not really remote sensing data susceptible. Um, we can't really use direct earth observations, but we can use some proxies. And we can also use auxiliary geospatial data sets like those that here we use the vulnerability index developed by the HARP Foundation and looking at the vulnerability classes around. But a lot of it is also dependent on, again, the accessibility distribution of clinics and as simple as road network availability. Here you see the example of the existing roads, which map very nicely large interstates in the center of the country. And the red shows how digitized um, road networks from Google Earth, which again, in these remote areas that are particularly strongly impacted by malaria are largely missing. And then another thing I already mentioned is that monsoon plays a really pivotal role, role in malaria seasonality in Myanmar and in the Great Mekong region in whole. And monsoon is a very dynamic parameter. So we use earth observations, particularly cloud cover, to identify the onset and the end period of monsoon. And monsoon um, impacts both the behavior of the vectors and the prevalence and the abundance, as well as the human activity on the landscape. So all that is very important. So we combine the estimates in the malaria burden potential variable, and we use extensive interviews with the in-country public health professional and medical professionals to assign various weights to the model. 
And then we essentially build the eight-day um, effective predictive model that looks at the distribution of the malaria burden across Myanmar as a whole. And on the left, you see the graphic which shows you over two year period, the variability in the area under moderate risk by three most malarious states in Myanmar. Those are actually shown in this lime color against the darker green background. And we can use those to observe the distribution and the state of the level of the high risk within this Chin state in Myanmar within moderate area in Penanthiri in Myanmar. And we have a very specific spatial temporal resolution. The eight week observation period gives us about anywhere between, uh, I would say a month and two month predictive capability of where the next outbreak is likely to occur. And this is Mandalay region, very low risk area. And as you can see, it really picks up very nicely the absence of activity as well. So unfortunately, because of the coup, we are unable to maintain our previous working relationship with the public health professionals to whom we were supposed to uh, migrate our system and enable their capabilities. So now we pivoted to developing web GIS reporting systems, and we're hoping to have them live within, um, by probably September, forecasting malaria across Myanmar in hope that in the very near future, we'll be able to enable, again, the public health response in case of the outbreaks. And that is all for today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, again, one uh, interesting presentation on the topic. Tatiana, actually, uh, I would like to ask you, because I, I saw your presentation that uh, you are uh, dealing with the use of Landsat data, 30, 30 meter resolution data. And I do understand that you are uh, treating data I mean, on a systematic basis, on an eight day basis or something like that. So my, my, my question is that, uh, yes, as we are in the era of the big Earth observation data, and there are uh, many more missions, uh, Earth observation, or um, providing Earth observation data, and, uh, can I ask you what uh, you uh, think is going to be the future for studies like yours, I mean, in, 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 uh, in these areas? I mean, what uh, you anticipate in uh, modeling uh, uh, mosquito and vector-borne diseases uh, with the advancement and the advent of the new Earth observation sensors, like uh, leader sensors, LIDAR sensors, or radar sensors? I don't know if you could elaborate a bit more on it. No, it's really, truly very, very exciting that we're having new capabilities now. We're so used to dealing with optical and thermal observations, and we have been limited to optical and thermal for a long time. The radar and LIDAR are giving us unprecedented capabilities to, I think, identify areas both of uh, that are very specific to mosquito habitat, particularly LIDAR that allows us to characterize 3D vegetation in the tropics is going to be super helpful. But radar is mostly exciting because we can now look at, instead of using proxy estimates for surface water distribution, which is critical for mosquito habitat availability, right? we can now finally be able to get direct observations of surface water distribution, especially during the monsoon season. That's probably some of the most exciting things that I think are on the horizon right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, it's um, also obvious from the presentation of uh, Francis and, uh, and Nikos that uh, there is uh, a lot to be derived from the Earth observation data, either directly or indirectly in, in regard to the factors that uh, are used in, in modeling uh, for uh, mosquito prediction of mosquito abundance or uh, human risk. Uh, Nikos, and, uh, let's, no, let's start from Francis because I, 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 I 
I, I, in, in, in some of uh, part of the presentation of Francis, it was uh, mentioned the um, adequacy presence or absence of in situ data. Uh, if, if I get the meaning of the presentation correctly, um, I do understand that in certain cases, in situ data, especially mosquito data, are missing in uh, as uh, um, um, input into the modeling. Uh, so, uh, Francis, how much do you think that the Earth observation data, especially the new data, the Copernicus missions, that uh, are providing us uh, uh, data very often at uh, high spatial resolution, you think is good for uh, um, complete uh, uh, the absence or scarcity of data, of in situ data in, in, the, in the modeling of, uh, of mosquito or vector borne diseases? Yeah, I think that's the only alternative we have. I mean, ideally, we would have we would ask people to provide data from everywhere and uh, in real time. I mean, to check every day with a mosquito trap how many mosquitoes are active and uh, able to bite people. But it, it's just not possible to do it. So we have a certain data set. So we have data from where the people are working routinely on a routine basis. Uh, and they can provide data. So the only way, I mean, we are obliged to extrapolate these data to other places, and that's where the Earth observation data are useful. So the, the, the major work will be to define we, exactly which parameter. So the models are, are there for, for that. I mean, we, have, we use the models, we apply them, and then it gives us, it says you that this kind of data are useful to predict when comparing to uh, the situation in other places with the same model, this kind of thing. But I mean, th this process is is um, is a permanent process of working, of improving the model. And then uh, maybe once we will be able to say, yeah, these, these kind of data sets are really uh, important for our modeling. And then, uh, yes, the, the new, I mean, the, the surface, the water surface, for example, that would be very crucial, not for the tiger mosquito, because this one is breeding in very small uh, containers that cannot be visible on a, on a satellite image. But other mosquitoes, like the, the salt marsh mosquito, Aedes caspis, for rift valley fever assessment, that would be very useful, or for Aedes vexans, also for rift valley fever, this kind of Earth observation data of the floodings that in real time, that would be perfect to predict and to, to direct the mosquito control uh, actions. Okay. Currently, we are doing that from the ground. I mean, the people go to the to the side. They look if the water is there, how much water is, how much area uh, is flooded. If mosquitoes larvae are there, and then they do some treatment. But if if uh, satellite images or or drones, they are now using drones also would help to improve that system to make it more rapid and more cheap, that would be uh, excellent. Okay, thank you, thank you, Francis. Um, and now I think uh, it's uh, actually the question for Nikos. Uh, and uh, Nikos, you mentioned in your presentation several factors which affect the, the, the expansion of the vector-borne diseases. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit more? I mean, uh, which are the main climatic factors that uh, affect uh, the infectious diseases, the, the outbreak of, of infectious diseases, and how much you believe Earth observation and uh, geo and geos data? I mean, all this uh, socioeconomic and geospatial information available today uh, can uh, really be for the benefit uh, of uh, the monitoring of such factors, I mean, climatic factors for the uh, modeling uh, issue. Yes, well, as, 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 I, as I indicated, um, we, we've, we've had uh, many years of, of work on that now, where many groups around the world have been trying to, to look at this association between climatic factors and the, um, you know, the effects on the transmission of infectious, of vector-borne infectious diseases. Um, now, these associations are quite well established but still we, we lack a little bit of an understanding um, of which other factors may play a fundamental role. And the reason, there are two reasons for that. For the, for the 
uh, environmental part is that um, uh, so far we, although you know, climatologists have been collecting data very systematically in a very good manner, and there is good information there, as indicated already, the area of entomology and um, the, the, the field studies there and the networks that already exist provide some information, but this information is not sufficient to allow us to do uh, a more detailed analysis. And uh, so besides the typical environmental factors we expect to affect the transmission, which is temperature, precipitation, etc. So one may think about other factors that may also affect uh, uh, the transmission, which, as I said, can be the changes in land use and land cover, the water uh, management practices, all these affect Ur urbanization is a huge issue. And uh, of course, it was mentioned also in Tatiana's talk, and I consider that as a very important thing, is to be able to do an assessment of population density in an area. And in the GRC, we have a very good tool, actually, and we've had developed also very good um, technology there uh, to do that globally. So, and, uh, so all these um, uh, satellite-derived um, information I believe will give an impetus now to look at, um, at the issue in a more, um, um, uh, in a broader way so that we can not only identify factors, but I think we have to take the next step and see which of these, what is the relative importance of these factors? Which are, of these factors are more important than others? Now we have a little bit of, uh, you know, a collection of several factors. We know a little bit about some, uh, but there are many things to still be investigated. So Earth observation in this case will, I believe will be very, very interesting in, uh, in uh, complementing this uh, collection of data, uh, but still the key is to have it systematically collected at the European level. Okay. It is not enough to have here and there locally which are very nice efforts from people, but it is not enough. We have to find a way to collect this information systematically, at least at the European level. So otherwise we won't make progress. This is, this is a very good point, Nikos. Thank you very much. And this is what has been the vision in uh, our uh, action in the EuroGR uh, group uh, that uh, we want to have, if possible, a systematic uh, or set, actually, a standardized approach so as to collect data, process data, and have the data process with the same standard. And uh, of course, uh, likely uh, integrate the data from uh, in situ uh, uh, information that, I mean, traps actually, trap data that uh, they are um, uh, deployed and um, um, maintained by, by our partners. Uh, it, there is also a question uh, which maybe Jonas could, uh, a, a question from audience now that I can see, and maybe Jonas could elaborate on that. Uh, this is actually on the standard standardization of policies. Actually, one of uh, our colleagues says here that uh, there are, uh, in almost every country, uh, uh, taking specific decisions for policies about the control, uh, surveillance and control and um, uh, mitigation, let's say, of, uh, of uh, diseases, of the outbreak of diseases. However, from country to country, this uh, vary a lot. And there is no standard, even at, uh, I mean, not uh, even at Europe, I mean, at European Union level. Uh, um, so what do you think, Jonas, especially because um, you are um, uh, dealing a lot with the, the, the expansion of all these tropical exotic arboviruses diseases uh, for which uh, Europe has been alerted the last year. So what do you think about this and what is your, I mean, the points that you would like to raise on that? I think this is a very good question, and I think we need to work on this uh, on the European level, although I think there would be great efforts. However, I would like to really focus on a point that I think is really uh, important, and, and, and Tatjana raised this point. In the end, uh, we have established um, methods and measures to contain such epidemics and control them very fast. We have vaccines, we have control programs, but in the end, the human destroyed us 
like in Myanmar with a coup d'etat, or we have the same examples in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo with the Ebola virus. So in the end, um, humans are the problems. And <laughs> I think we need first to solve the problems, how we interact with each other and how we can live friendly and in peace together. Uh, I think this is still one of the major problems. Um, however, back to science and back to Europe. And um, I'm quite happy with the um, notification system that is established uh, in the EU. So ECDC report uh, all the cases, for example, for West Nile virus or imported dengue virus infection and so on and so on. However, there are still a lot of things to do in terms of harmonization and uh, to be more fast. So there, I, I agree that there are important differences between the different member countries uh, in, in the speed how they report the data. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, they uh, informed me that uh, we have to close the session. Uh, I don't know if uh, maybe one, uh, any of our colleagues want to add anything. Uh, 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 if not, uh, on my side, I would like to thank you very much, all the speakers, uh, for the nice presentations. Uh, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to participate in this meeting and also to thank all our uh, colleagues that uh, have uh, uh, participated in the session and um, um, uh, thank you again. Uh, I think it's uh, time to close. Uh, see you soon. Bye bye.